Um, I'm the vice president of the Anthrozo Anthrozoology Club um, at U Windsor. So good evening, everybody. Um, we do tonight. We are honored to be joined by Morena Wigmore of the Halliburton Forest and Wildlife Reserve. She will be talking to us not only about the wolves that live in the forest reserve, but also their unique approach to public education. The Halliburton Forest is home to the Halliburton Wildlife Reserve and Wolf Center. The Wolf Center is a 5,000 square foot all indoor facility that houses self-guided museum style exhibits, a cinema, a classroom, a souvenir shop, and a large indoor observatory. With live wolf cams and wolf exhibits, you can almost always catch a glimpse of wolves as they wander through their large naturally forested environment. This is not your typical zoo. The facility is designed to mimic the wild as closely as possible, so people do not touch or interact with the wolves in any way. The wolves are unsocialized and because of this, they maintain their fear of humans like, the, like a wild wolf. This also means they maintain much of the behavior and social structures of wild packs and we're able to observe them in a way that is not typical, typically possible in a zoo environment. This is the future of animal sanctuaries. Having a cottage nearby, Morena visited the Wolf Center frequently as a child. In 2014, she joined the Halliburton Forest team as seasonal staff, and after three years and completing a Bachelor of Arts at the University of Waterloo, she transitioned to full-time. In 2020, Morena st stepped into the Wolf of into the role of Wolf Center coordinator with a clear vision for the potential of the facility and a passion for sharing her love of the incredible wolves she works alongside with the public. Today, she joins us to share the unique relationship between people and wolves at the Halliburton Forest Wolf Center. Everyone, please welcome Marina Wigmore. Hi. Hi. Uh, pleasure to join you guys tonight. Um, cool. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about what happened at the place that I work at um, to start off with, and then we'll kind of go from there. And I, I like to have these kind of talks be very natural and flowy. So please, if you have questions, um, I'll kind of do like a beginning spiel, but then we'll lots of time for back and forth after. Um, so yeah, as you said, the Wolf Center is kind of a weird, non-typical facility. Um, basically, we just watch the wolves um our our center is set up that we have no direct interaction with the animals we don't talk to them we don't touch them we don't enter their space unless we absolutely have to um certainly with the exception being we have to provide their food for them so really that's the only time they even see people is when we're throwing their food into the enclosure for them which is a very brief kind of moment of time maybe five minutes um that they actually see humans um, other than when we're doing, you know, fence repairs or maintenance and that sort of thing. So because of that, our animals do have a lot more of the natural sort of behaviors and feelings towards humans that wild wolves would have as compared to zoo animals who are in constant view of humans, who are, you know, trained to present themselves in a certain way to be able to provide medical care or things like this. Um, we really don't have the opportunity for any of that sort of thing. Um, so one kind of thing that we often come across, you know, certainly at a strange facility like this where we don't touch or interact with the animals is the question of veterinary care um, because we can't touch them. So really all we can do for them vet wise is by way of food. So for example, things like deworming, which is just a tablet that goes into sausages, which we have a very hard time throwing to them. Um, they're terrified of people to begin with. And then you add people throwing stuff at their face. Um, they don't love that. Um, but usually we're pretty good and we're able to get them all dewormed, which happens every other month. Um, uh, and then, you know, for example, if we thought one of them maybe had an infection or something like this, and our vet suggested maybe let's put some antibiotic in the food and try to get it to that animal, then we can do that as well. Um, but that's, that's really the extent of it is observation. Are they behaving abnormally? Are they showing signs of injury or discomfort or anything like this? Um, and we kind of just report it to our vet. And most of the time, the response is just keep watching, keep documenting what you're seeing. Um, wolves are very, very resilient and strong animals, not like our, <laughs> our domestic dogs at home. Um, you know, certainly I have a little nine week old puppy at the moment. Um, he gets pinned on the ground and he squeals. That is not how it happens with wolves. I mean, the young ones might do that too. 
but uh, they're very strong and resilient. So sometimes we see some pretty horrific stuff. Wolves have teeth and can be nasty. And like any animal on the planet, they do fight. Um, so that's certainly a challenge that we face at the center is public perception on that aspect. Um, but then when you explain to people the why we don't touch them and why we don't interfere, you get this different kind of shift in mentality of like, wait a second, okay, this makes sense. You know, this is what's gonna be happening in the wild. You're making sure that these animals aren't gonna just die on you. Um, you're still looking after them, but in such a way that allows them to still be wolves, to still maintain that natural behavior, to have the space to be away from humans if they don't wanna hear us, if they don't wanna smell us, they can take off to the other end of the enclosure and they don't have to be anywhere near. Um, and, and really kind of the other part of that is the one-way glass. I know that was one of the questions um, that you had sent me ahead there, Tammy, um, was some of you were wondering about what the importance of the one-way glass is. So for those that don't know, um, the way that we observe the wolves is through one-way glass, such that the wolves can't see us. They can still hear us and smell us. There's nothing we can do about that. Uh, they have a very strong sense of smell and hearing that would take like a very thick concrete wall to prevent them from being able to smell or hear it. Um, but taking away that visual element really increases their comfort and allows them to just be themselves without that, like, what is that thing doing? What's happening? You know, and that distraction of it. Most of the time, they just tune us out. If they hear maybe a sudden noise or a little kid scream, they might kind of look toward the building. But most of the time, they just ignore what's happening. And that's exactly the way we want it to be. We don't want our presence there to impact them if we can avoid it at all. Um, and that allows them to just be wolves, to behave naturally, to be comfortable. Um, you know, certainly in our own homes, we probably behave a little differently than we do when we're out in public. But if you knew that you were on camera while you're at home or you could, you know, things like this, you, you would feel a little uncomfortable and you'd probably behave a little differently. Um, versus just being able to hear your neighbors outside and knowing that you have curtains and they're not peeking in on you or something like this would be a good way to compare it and kind of think about how that one-way glass benefits the animals and us too. You know, being able to, to see those things that you don't see in a typical zoo type environment, um, both the good and the bad, you know, you get to see all of it, not just the happy, beautiful, cute, uh, side of nature, we get to see the whole picture. And that whole picture is really important when we're trying to, you know, learn enough about the animal to, to help them continue on into the future and help with conservation efforts and protection efforts. Um, yeah, it's, it's critical to look at every piece and not just what pleases us. Mm -hmm. Uh, where to go from there? Do you have any like questions of where you'd like me kind of to direct from here? Well, I mean, I do have one question. Um, just to help us visualize the size of the enclosed wolf area, I, like I have trouble visualizing square feet. So, can you give me like a reference? Yeah. So the enclosure itself is just over seven acres in size, which is about seven NFL football fields in size to give you a rough idea. Um, wow. Or another way to look at it is most residential lots in the city are about a quarter acre. Some might be a half. Um, so you're looking at, what is that, four times seven, 28 house lots in a city or like a little subdivision area. Um, so it's quite expansive and it's big enough that we can't see all of it. Even now when the leaves have fallen and all the brush has kind of diminished, we can see a little bit deeper into the enclosure, but we still can't see all of it. Um, so it's, it's expansive. It takes about half an hour for us to walk the full exterior of the enclosure. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Does, does anyone else have any questions at this moment? You can raise your hand or just go ahead and unmute yourself. Oh, Chelsea. Chelsea has her hand up. 
Hi, I might I might have totally missed this. I'm sorry, my house is a bit chaotic at the moment. Um, how did you originally um, come to get the wolves, or how did how did the enclosure get the wolves? And I know with um, a few guest speakers who we've talked to in the past, some um, rehabilitation centers or so forth have given their animals a form of birth control, so they're not breeding in captivity. Do you guys do the same thing or do you do you not? Ah, OK, so two good questions. We'll go one at a time. Um, no, that's a really good question to start with is, is <laughs> why do we exist even to begin with? Um, so our wolves originally came to us in the early 90s. Uh, there was a gentleman who lived down in Michigan uh, in the Upper Peninsula there who had. Come across, I guess, uh, some pups. Um, he had seen an ad in like a hunting magazine or something like this of pups for sale. He went and picked them up and kept his own enclosure with wolves. And over time, um, they transitioned to another owner and that owner kind of decided to go to the method of not interacting with the animals very much and not socializing with them. Um, and as time went on, unfortunately, he was going through a divorce and had to sell the land that the wolves were living on. So he had to find a new home for them. Um, and you may have heard of a naturalist named R.D. Lawrence. He's quite well known in Canada. He uh, has had a home here in Halliburton when he was alive uh, and had been down in Michigan observing this pack, was absolutely fascinated by what this gentleman was doing with not interacting with the animals and not socializing with them and, and just kind of educating people about them there. And so when the situation came up that he had to find a new place for these animals to live, he approached the owner of Halliburton Forest, who is one of those people that just, you tell him he can't do it and he'll find a way to do it. Um, and basically was crazy enough to say, yeah, let's build this big enclosure for a pack of wolves and move them across the border um, and learn about them and, and do something different here. And so, they moved them across the border uh, and a couple of years later built the education center to complement the enclosure um, with the help of R.D. Lawrence kind of teaching our staff about the wolves and what he'd observed and how to care for them and all these sorts of things um, until we actually opened the wolf center in 96 and we're still going on. Um, part of the still going on kind of feeds into your second question. Um, our wolves do naturally reproduce in the enclosure, so we don't give them any sort of birth control. We do want that part of their life to be natural as well, which raises another question. Uh, yes, wolves do inbreed. Okay, um, They're a little bit more Game of Thrones than we are, um, so it is normal for them to breed within the family. Certainly not exclusively. In the wild, you're going to have maybe a young mature wolf that decides to separate from its pack and try to establish its own situation, particularly if it sees that there's available territory, resources, and mates. Those are kind of like the big three things. Um, but often it's the case as well that if those resources, territory, and mates are not available, their safest option is to remain with their pack. And typically when that alpha male or female, which is your breeding pair, passes away, it's gonna be one of those younger animals that's stepping up into that role. And that's typically son, daughter, um, a relative of some kind stepping into that that higher role and that breeding role. So we see the same thing at our facility. Um, right now it's mother and son is our current alpha pair. Um, and it's often the case that it's mother and son, father and daughter, aunt and nephew, this sort of combination. Um, and we don't see the same sort of genetic repercu repercussions like you would expect with dogs or humans. Um, and this is Kind of the cool thing with wolves, they have their own sort of process of weeding those potential genetic issues out. Um, so firstly, they have just that alpha pair reproducing. So you have your strongest, healthiest male, strongest, healthiest female, who've kind of proven their, that they are the strongest and healthiest as your one reproducing pair within the pack. Typically, it's just that one pair reproducing possible that you might have a second female reproduce into the pack as well typically you're just going to have the one um so you have just that strongest healthiest male and female 
And then of their offspring, only 50% will survive to adulthood. And of that 50%, again, you only have your alpha male and female from that group that get to reproduce. So often is the case, you know, we have a litter born and that entire litter will never reproduce um, just because none of them ever take on that, that alpha breeding role. So they kind of filter out any of these sort of potential genetic issues by way of just a, they don't survive to adulthood to the point that they can reproduce that only the strong genetics are passing on through the line that they don't come across these issues. Seems really weird, but at the same time, it's one of those really smart, cool things in nature that it just seems to know what it's doing better than we do. So on that note, though, how how do the numbers not get out of control? I mean, I know there's only one breeding pair and whatever, but there's only infinite, there's only finite space, right? It's not infinite. So how does that work? Yeah, another good question. Um, so as I mentioned, half do die in the first year and a half. Most of that's in the first couple days or hours um, of the ones that aren't going to make it. But then we also do donate puppies to other education facilities. Um, so depending on the year and what our current pack looks like, what pups are born, what facilities are lined up, you may opt to donate some to other places. Um, for example, we've actually sent puppies as far as Vienna, Austria before. Um, and when we're looking for these facilities to donate to, we're pretty particular on where they're gonna go. Um, we won't send them to any facility where you're gonna have members of the public coming in and paying to touch the animals or you know, do some kind of cool wolf act. No, that's icky. <laughs> Um, what's the point in sending them there when it's completely opposite of what we do? Um, we look for facilities where it's really only staff that might have an interaction with the animal. There's an education focus on what's happening at that facility and or research based. So, for example, that facility I mentioned in Austria, um, they have several packs of wolves and of dogs. And they, they do research on the differences between the two and have them doing different tasks and things like this. Um, so it's really quite an interesting facility there. Um, but yeah, the premise being that if their quality of life is going to be worsened or if they're going to lose too much of that natural sort of element, then what's the point in sending them somewhere else? We'd rather just hang on to them. Um, but yeah, that's that's really how the population control goes. Uh, that along with the wolves themselves, um, they do do a little bit of their own population control. Um, we keep our numbers no more than 12 intentionally to try to avoid them feeling the need to control their populations. Um, so that way they always have enough space, always have enough food. Um, but even when you control numbers, there's going to be fighting and there's going to be disagreement and there's going to be deaths. Um, that is naturally how it goes for wolves. A lot of them do die by way of the pack um, as awful as that sounds and it, it is it is awful um we see some pretty awful stuff um that is probably the least fun part of the job is dealing with the aftermath of that or <laughs> the actual event of that um but yeah the the wolves do in in some ways control their population too uh do you suffer any backlash from the public for the quote unquote natural way that you leave them in Not terms typically. of medical in terms of medical issues or death or things like that. Yeah, not typically. Um, you know, you always have people that ask questions. And that's great. We want people to ask questions because it does, without background information, even myself, if I was going somewhere, I'd be like, uh, what do you mean that you don't provide medical for your animals? That sounds that sounds weird. That's not normal for other facilities that have animals in their care. And it is weird. It is very weird. Um, but typically, once you talk with people and explain the why, you can see the light in their eyes change and you can see their perception changing as you're talking to them and explaining them. And you, for almost all of them, really, you and end up seeing them walking away feeling like, no, that's different. And it's a good different. Um, you know, maybe we should be doing more of this kind of thing. Like, I really like this. You know, it seems backwards, but is 
is what's going on elsewhere what's backwards and it's really interesting to be able to have that conversation with people and see see it shift while you're talking to them and that's what's so important about education whether it's a typical zoo or a place like us is passing that information along because without that information i mean we know nothing really <laughs> Um, and, and it's hard to to have an opinion or a judgment on on any of this sort of stuff until you're given that information. I had actually um, on that topic a couple of weeks ago, I had this rather nasty email come my way of a woman who failed to ask questions while she was visiting. Um, so she had caught on like some bits and pieces that she heard the staff kind of talking to other people. Um, but didn't actually pipe up and, and clarify anything for herself. So she sent an email months after she had visited, totally freaking out, like, I can't believe you guys don't provide medical and like this, this, and this, and this. And so I called her and I talked to her and I was like, hang on a second. Whoa, 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 whoa. We have this all backwards. I'm so glad you reached out though, because, you know, the information that you've kind of put together from the bits and pieces you heard is not right. And as soon as you hear the correct information, you're going to feel a lot better because if we actually did what you think we did, I would not work here. <laughs> um, so you got the odd one like that where people reach out, but that's the whole point of the Wolf Center is to educate people. So we want people to challenge us. We want people to ask those questions. It means that they care about the animals and they're actually putting some critical thinking skills at work when they're visiting places that house animals. Because there are some bad places out there, for sure. We've all seen Tiger King. <laughs> Thankfully, I've avoided watching it. But no, that's a that's a really that's a very good answer. Thank you. Um, does anyone else have questions at the moment? I yeah. have a question. Sure. Um, I was wondering about how you keep everyone contained. And if you run into any problems with other wild populations, whether it be like you mentioned bears, so I don't know if bears are a problem or um, if the wolves are naturally inclined to follow a prey that might come in. Like, how do you deal with that type of stuff when it's when it's closed off for them? Yeah, um, so the enclosure setup is a double fence. Um, so they have an interior fence and then about 15, 20 feet back, there's a secondary fence. Um, so it's, you know, for any large animals, it's not even possible for them to get nose to nose at the fence line. They'd have to get through <laughs> through the first fence and then to the second fence. Um, we typically don't see a lot of signs of like tracks of other animals around the exterior of the enclosure. I have seen moose prints before. I have seen wild wolf prints before, deer prints or things like this. So certainly there have been wild animals kind of scope the area out. But I would imagine for those animals, the enclosure area would have a very, very strong wolf smell because they are always in that same space. There's a good number of them. They really do stink. Um, <laughs> and I would imagine that for any wildlife coming nearby, they'd smell that and be like, ooh, yeah, that's a no. I'm going to, I'm, that's all I need. I'm just going to smell what I smell and I'm, I'm heading out. So we really don't have too much issue, um, with wild animals. I mean, squirrels are fun. Um, sometimes squirrels like to come into the enclosure and you'll get the odd time that the wolves chase them. Most of the time they actually ignore them, um, because they're not hungry. And so if they're not hungry, there's no reason to chase and waste the energy on trying to chase an animal if they're not going to eat it. Um, the younger ones, maybe a little bit more on the playful side might chase them. Or if a bird hits the window, that is very fun. Um, usually it won't hit the ground after it's hit the window. They get it pretty quickly. Um, but yeah, there's not, not a whole lot going on in the way of, of wild interactions with the wolves. So following to that then, to that question, when a wolf dies in the enclosure, normally mm -hmm. other animals would come and eat the body, right? So is it just the birds, carrion birds, or what is it? Do you take care of it to use the body for science? Yeah, if we have the opportunity to, if we're aware that the animal has passed away quickly, which we're not always, um, because they have that space that we can't always see them, 
Um, if we do have the opportunity to get to them quickly enough to get all of the remains, absolutely. We want to find out what cause of death is. If it's a really old wolf, we're probably not gonna do a whole lot. Um, if it's a younger wolf and we have the opportunity for a necropsy to find out more, absolutely, we want to find out more. Um, often is the case, there's not much left and it happens very quickly. Uh, it is actually mostly the other wolves that are responsible for it. Um, so it's gonna sound really horrible. The only way, the only way to talk about it is to laugh with it. I've seen, you know, one of them carrying around body parts of one of the other wolves. Um, it's not a fun thing to see because for our staff, they're the next closest thing to our own pets at home, right? You know, we have a, a strong bond and relationship with them, even though they have zero relationship with us. Um, so you do have to deal with those kind of horrific scenes and retrieving them is often in various states of completion. Um, sometimes we never find the body um, or, you know, months or years later, we might find the skull. And uh, yeah, it's it's a challenging part, but for sure, they they will consume each other. They're not going to waste resources. Um, wolves are survival focused. Everything with them is about survival. If they don't have to exert energy, they're not going to do it. They're going to conserve it for when they need it. Or if there's available food and resources, they're not going to waste it. They're not going to let it sit. Uh, even if their bellies are full, the second there's a little wee bit of space, they're going to fill it again. It's just part of their natural instincts that they don't know when the next food is coming. Um, you know, and we try to mimic that for them as well with randomized feedings that they are only eating once every five to 10 days um, and in very large quantities. So they don't have a set day or a set time that it's happening, you know, it's different days of the week, different times of day, intentionally to keep that natural kind of instinct going in that natural pattern of eating that it's not like a routine schedule expected thing for them either. So when you have to go into the enclosures, how does that work? Do they, do you have some way to bar them off in a part of it or do you just kind of hope and run? <laughs> yeah, uh, running's a bad idea. Uh, yes. Never run in a wolf enclosure. Um, no, actually because of our unsocialized re kind of relationship with them, they are still afraid of people. So certainly we try to avoid entering, but when we do have to, for example, like when puppies are born and we need to check the den and see how many and all this sort of thing, um, we go as a team. That's the biggest thing. It's a group of staff who are fully comfortable entering. Nobody goes in if they aren't 100% comfortable and confident. Um, usually five-ish, four to six people, roughly. Um, and you have various instruments that we carry. So typically everybody has like a pepper spray, like a bear spray on them. Super, super effective. For example, we also keep them at our dog kennel. So if there's a fight there, if you spray that pepper spray in the middle of the fight, it's done. <laughs> um, so if we ever had to use something like that, that would be a very quick, very effective deterrent without causing any real harm to the animal. Fortunately, we never have to use it, but you still got to be precautious just in case. Um, so pepper spray, things like air horns. Uh, usually we have a staff with a non-lethal, so like a paintball gun. And typically one staff with a lethal as well, depending on what the nature of our reason for entry is. So certainly when we're doing the den check, we do have one staff with a lethal just to be safe. Um, again, never had to use it, but it's worth taking the precaution. Because for example, if one of them had a brain tumor and suddenly was behaving differently than what we expected there's no way for us to predict that in advance they we might just get in there and suddenly they're behaving different um so yeah it, it's all about taking precautions being comfortable being confident but also being quick um you know if we don't have to be in their space for a long amount of time we don't want to um because they are clearly uncomfortable you know typically they totally run away from us and we barely see them you might see them kind of like dashing by in the bush on the far end of the enclosure opposite of us. Um, but we can tell that they're uncomfortable. So we want to get in and out um, as quickly as we can without running. 
Good point. Nobody run near wolves, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I know that'll, uh, that'll trigger the predatory kind of reflexes. Um, I'm not seeing any hands up, so I actually do have another question. Um, do you see any notable differences in behavior between your pack and a wild pack? Is there anything you have noticed? Uh, I mean, certainly the, there's a whole lot lost in, in the way of hunting. Um, there's not as much going on in the way of sharing the knowledge of how to hunt, the skill involved with it, the building of, of muscle and endurance and this sort of thing. Um, yeah, so it's, it's, there's those certain behaviors. I would like to think that our wolves are maybe not quite as nasty to each other as wild ones, but Luna makes me question that. Um, so yeah, I mean, Luna then, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, they would also lose the interactions with other wildlife um, too. But yeah, Luna, let's come back to Luna. She's always a good time to talk about. Uh, Luna is a 10 and a half year old wolf, which is absolutely incredible. Average lifespan for a wolf is only four to five years. Um, we typically see five to six at our facility. So 10 and a half is well beyond what we would expect. Um, she's actually the second oldest wolf we've ever had, just behind Smudge, who made it just shy of 12, and the oldest female we've ever had. Um, typically we do see males living a little longer than the females, um, and higher ranking wolves living longer than lower ranking wolves. So she is the alpha female. She's been the alpha female since she was a year and a half old, which is also very early to take on that role. She wasn't even sexually mature when she took on that role. And this happened actually because of a horrible thing. Um, unknown group of people decided to cut our enclosure open. And Luna's parents and her two brothers went into the wild and died uh, as a result of the fence being cut. Um, so after the loss of those four animals, it left Luna, uh, one of her litter mates, her sister Layla, and three younger siblings. And so Luna was the one that stepped up and kind of led that group of girls through this challenging time. And uh, we ended up having to introduce another male to the enclosure because we had none left. All three had left and died in the wild. Um, so we brought in Fang, which is another story. I'm going to circle back to Fang. I'll tell more about Luna and circle back to Fang because he's also very fascinating. Um, so Luna took on that role before she was even mature um, and then has held it throughout her lifetime. She is an incredible example of an alpha female. Um, she's actually killed five other females to maintain her, her position. Um, so she, as the alpha female has the job of stressing any other mature females to the point that they don't even go into heat. Um, and this may be by way of physical abuse. This might be by psychological torment, um, by excluding them from pack activities. For example, like when they howl as a group. Um, Quest is not allowed to howl with them, and this is just one of the ways that Luna keeps her in a subordinate position. Um, and if she does try to howl, Luna's going to jump and attack her. Um, so Luna's just a beast, really. She's she's really good at what she does. She's had eight litters of puppies, um, totaling over thirty offspring. So, <laughs> and she's outlived most of them. <laughs> so. Luna's exceptional in a lot of ways. Um, she definitely exhibits a lot of behaviors like we would expect almost spot on to, to a wild animal. And to have survived as long as she has is <laughs> absolutely amazing. Um, and we have no idea how much longer she has. She might have three months. She might have three years. Um, she seems to be doing very well still. So I wouldn't, I mean, I would be and I wouldn't be surprised if she made it to like 14 uh, who knows with luna um so she is yeah luna's uh luna's pretty impeccable if you have a chance if you go on our our social media you'll see lots of pictures of luna after after this chat if you have a second just scroll through and you'll be like i get it i see it <laughs> um the other one that i mentioned that i'm going to circle back to is fang 
Fang is a very odd duck or was a very odd duck. He's no longer with us. Um, Fang actually grew up at Jungle Cat World, um, just outside of Peterborough and Orno there, fully socialized. He interacted with people. He did educational programming with children. Um, dead opposite of what our facility is like. So when we were looking for another male, um, you know, we were scoping around for the right, the right sex, the right species, and the right age. And he was exactly the same age as Luna. Perfect. Uh, and very, very close by. So uh, we were like, okay, this is a little bit weird. Um, you know, he interacts with people. Uh, how's this going to go? Um, and he had actually just been retired from educational programming because he was coming into maturity. So he was about two and a half years old at this point. Um, coming into maturity, the hormones are starting to pump. He was a still intact male. Um, so he was being retired to an enclosure away from the public, or at least not that he was interacting anymore. Um, so right at that time was when we needed him. So we brought him up and uh, the staff that actually brought him up were super confused when the staff at Jungle Cat World just walked him out on a leash. Um, because <laughs> that's really weird for us. That's not something we could ever do with our wolves. If you ever got to touch one of our wolves while it was alive, that'd be absolutely crazy. Um, so they walked him out on a leash and our staff were like, are you, are you gonna like tranquilize him while we transport him? Nope, <laughs> uh, put him in a crate, off he went over to our enclosure. And then there was a lot of debate as to whether do a hard release or a soft release into the enclosure. Um, we do have an area actually because of when the fences were cut, we built a sectioned area that we could separate the enclosure into two spaces. And so the debate was whether to put him in that smaller area of the two spaces, kind of closer to us where we could observe him and have the rest of the, the females on the other side that they could meet kind of nose to nose through the fence first, or whether to just put him in there and see what happened. You know, we were all pretty confident at that point. He's a male. There's only females in there. They're going to figure out pretty quick that they need him. Um, so he's going to be okay. And so the decision was hard release. Let's do it. Let's put him in. And so we did. And uh, the first thing he did was he went to the pond and he swam and he swam and he swam and he kept on swimming to the point that our, our staff had to like, be like, Fang, like enough. You got to stop swimming. Go like somewhere else. <laughs> Um, cause he had never had the opportunity to swim before. Not, not something you would normally think about for wolves, but they do swim. They are good swimmers. Um, so he enjoyed swimming in the pond and, uh, Luna was of course the first to approach him and kind of be like, who are you? What the heck? Why are you in our space? Um, and certainly, uh, her and her sisters made, made it very clear that it was their house and it was their rules. And if he didn't want to follow them, he was going to get jumped. Um, they never caused him any significant injury. It was more of just like they would jump on him and scare the crap out of him. Um, although uh, one summer after him and Luna had successfully mated, um, I'll, I'll circle back to that again. Um, he was bald for a whole summer because he snapped at a puppy and uh, the girls did not like that at all. Um, but yeah, so initially, you know, they just kind of made sure that he knew that it was their space and laid down some rules because he was acting kind of weird <laughs> compared to what they were used to. Um, and come the following winter, come mating season, him and Luna figured it out <laughs> and had puppies. And, and then, yeah, as I said, uh, he learned not to mess with the puppies um, very quickly um, by way of being bald for the summer. Um, and as time went on and he continued to reproduce with Luna and more and more of the pack became his offspring versus non-blood relation, his status in the pack improved. Um, so certainly he was able to lay down some of the rules as opposed to being told the rules. Um, he stopped interacting with the puppies pretty much at all. <laughs> uh, he would kind of growl at them and get up and walk away from them, <laughs> which was kind of funny. He seemed like a grumpy old man when he did that. But some of the things that were most interest interesting about Fang were the behavioral differences between him and the wolves who'd lived in our enclosure the whole 
their whole lives. Um, because even though he was now in the same sort of setting and space as them, he had a lot of behaviors that were not something we had ever seen before. So for example, when it was food time, he would jump up and down at the fence. That is not a wolf behavior, that is a dog behavior. And that is learned from socialization, learning to be that excited at food. He was raised eating every day. So when he first came, we had to feed every day. And then we slowly stretched him out with bigger portions and longer distances between food, kind of match our pack. Um, and our wolves had also never had chicken before that. Um, so they were really weirded out by chicken the first time they had it. Um, Fang was, of course, thrilled. He was used to eating chicken every day. Um, but the rest of the pack was like, what is this? Do we eat this? can we eat this? And then they, see, of course, see Fang just guzzling it down and they figured it out. And then Fang got to eat for the first time deer and moose and beaver and um, learn all these different things and got to participate in the pack with ripping these, these carcasses apart and, and got to experience these other parts of being a wolf that he did, hadn't experienced before. Um, but another one, um, which is a behavior we all see when we go to zoos, was the pacing behavior. And even though he had this large space that he could roam, he still paced. Um, and, you know, this behavior in zoos comes from typically those larger animals that in the wild would be traveling tens of miles a day. And that's just part of, you know, their natural drive, looking for food, keeping themselves safe and on the move and all this sort of thing. And when they're in, you know, an enclosure space and they, they can't go tens of miles a day, they get that distance in by going back and forth. And, you know, certainly part of its agitation too, but it's exercise, it's instinct, it's all these things. And so even though Fang now had all this extra space that there was no need for him to pace, he still did. Um, not like to the degree you would, you would normally see at a zoo with, you know, like a tiger or, or a wolf at the zoo or a polar bear or any of those sorts of animals. Um, he had his kind of spot that he liked to sit and a couple times a day he would get up and do, you know, one to three laps back and forth along the fence line. And then he'd, he'd chill out again. Um, but that behavior was learned from where he came from and he, he carried it on even though he didn't have to. So that was a really peculiar, we learned so much from Fang. He was so unusual to us, but it really showed us how what we do makes a difference in the behavior that we see and how the animals live their lives because he wasn't <laughs> wasn't really a wolf he he was a wolf who acted like a dog and was trained like a dog and uh like he knew his name and all these sorts of things um and so we very quickly kind of cut off any nobody was to talk to him nobody's to call his name we want him to fit in with this pack and and to live as natural life as possible um and it took him a long time to really get into it but there were certain behaviors that never disappeared and never changed they stayed with him until the end of his life wow that's fascinating um i believe chelsea has a question yeah i saw a hand there yeah thank you um, that's really, really fascinating. Oh my gosh. Um, now I, I had one experience, which is going to lead me to my next question. Um, it happened to me a couple of years back when I was living in Banff and, um, I was working on the gondola and I had to wake up at like oh, 5 AM to go to work. And I cut through the woods because it's a lot faster than cutting through the street and it was like minus 31 in February. And I was looking at my phone and I put my phone down for a second. And there was a timber wolf seven feet away from me staring at me. And I cannot tell you the panic that kicked in. Um, this thing was the size of a small black bear. It was just way bigger than any um, gray wolf I've ever seen which kind of leads me into my next question. Um, what uh, species of wolf do you have? Is it gray or is it a timber wolf? And um, if you know about species of wolves, is there a difference in 
Timber and Grey Wolves behavior from each other. Like if I ever were, not that I want to, approach them again, is there one where like you don't run with one or you run with the other or you just, is it kind of goes for the same for all wolf species? How does it, how does it vary? Cool. I like this question. This is a good one. Um, that is a very common description of what I hear when people tell me about wolf sightings they've had. I mean, it sounds like this one was a lot closer to you than most of the ones that I hear about. But um, so timber wolf is actually a type of gray wolf. So gray wolf is kind of like our big title at the top. And then in Canada, we have the Western timber wolf, which is Western Canada. We have the Eastern timber wolf, obviously Eastern Canada. Uh, there's the Algonquin wolf, which there's still a lot of debate as to whether they're a unique subspecies or not. And um, there's the coastal wolves, which are along the coast of BC. Uh, and there's, of course, Arctic wolves. Um, in general, whether it's wolves, bears, moose, deer, anything like this, the further west and the further north you go, the bigger they get. So certainly wolves kind of in Western Canada, where you would have been at this time, would be a heck of a lot bigger than what wild wolves would look like here in Ontario. Um, so no surprise that it was huge. Um, with any wolf, I wouldn't say run. It just don't. With wild animals in general, just don't. Yeah, running is no. Um, typically what's going to happen in those kind of encounters is that there's going to be a moment of observation. And then that fear kind of kicks in and they want to get away from you, right? You know, we have ways of learning about these animals. You know, we have obviously things like this that we're doing right now. We have books, we have movies, we have all sorts of sources of knowledge that we have information about these animals. And of course, we still have that natural instinct of fear. They have absolutely no way of learning about humans except through lived experience. So the saying they're more afraid of you than you are of them is absolutely the case you know the fear of the unknown is the really one of the biggest fears so often is the case with wolves when there is you know a sighting or you know a close proximity they just kind of stand they observe and then they kind of silently go on their way um yeah and, and this is almost every wolf sighting that that I've been told about by people is this is exactly how it goes. There's that observation and then they just go and they're quiet and they're gone. And the person is left there being like, uh, oh my God, what just happened? And you just kind of want to get inside or to where there's other people as quickly as possible. And that that's our natural instinct, you know? Our natural instinct is to be afraid of a wolf. It is a predator, it is a large animal. We certainly have no idea how to defend ourselves. Um, and compared to a wolf, we are not equipped um, to, re to really go up against the wolf. Um, but yeah, for any, for any wolf, any wild animal, really, I would say, if you respect them, they respect you. You know, give them their distance. Um, you know, you can make yourself big and make noise. That's what they say for bears, to kind of scare them off. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that with a wolf. I, I would just do that silent kind of respecting thing. Your body is, is naturally telling you what to, what to do in that situation. It's kind of giving you that like, oh my God, I need to just stop and freeze and not do anything sort of thing. And that's exactly what I, I would tell someone to do as well is just let that moment of observation happen. And they're just going to go, they're going to go off on their way. Um, is very rare that that sort of interaction would end any differently than that. Cool. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, would You mentioned movies. Would you say that movies get it right or get it wrong on a whole? Because I know with like black dog syndrome and black animal syndrome, right? Movies just make them very hard to adopt because they always make them evil. Um, do you find that media makes it difficult to sell helping wolves or <laughs> um historically media has been very very bad for wolves i mean we've all heard little red riding hood big bad wolf uh three little pigs all these sorts of you know stories that have been carried on for thousands of years of wolves being this awful nasty predator um it's been getting better um certainly we've seen 
a huge increase in people relating to the idea of the lone wolf um, <laughs> and it being kind of a pop culture phenomenon, like the number of people who come in with wolf tattoos or wearing a wolf shirt already or this sort of thing. Um, people are starting to see wolves as cool, um, which is exciting, but also dangerous too. Um, because with that, we've seen an increase in people procuring wolf dog hybrids as pets um, and them being quite prevalent in the exotic animal trade. Um, some of it's by accident, you know, up in northern communities, it does happen that somebody has their own dog that lives outside and a wolf comes along and they reproduce. Um, but there definitely has been more instances of breeding happening specifically to create these gorgeous beautiful big animals that they hope behave like a dog but i can tell you right now <laughs> that's not going to happen there's no way to predict the behavior of an animal like that there are very few people who would be able to give a wolf dog hybrid of any content whether it's a low content that's like two to five percent or a high content above ten percent um, you know, to, to have the skills, knowledge, training, lifestyle to be able to just exercise it enough. Uh, very few people can do that. And, and so we see actually more and more uh, wolf dog sanctuaries coming up um, all the time. There's a lot of them in the States. Um, there's really only one main one in Canada, which is Yamnuska out in Alberta. Um, they've got quite a number of wolf dog hybrids there. We actually, our, uh, our former owners used to have a wolf dog hybrid that they rescued um, from a place where it would have been put down. And he was a 50-50, and you could tell. He, uh, he actually would often hang out at the kennel with, our, with the huskies that we have. Um, nobody told me he was a hybrid when I first started working at the kennel, but I could tell that there's something different with him. He was bigger. His eyes were different. Um, he had that kind of amber color that wolves all have. Um, and he, he was weird. Um, he, when there was a dog fight that would break out, he would step in and protect the one that was getting bullied and he would put an end to the fight pretty quickly. Um, but I was also told he never did this with me. And I always wondered why, um, he would come up to staff and give them a little nip on the butt to test what their reaction would be to them. And to see where he stood with them. And he never did this to me. And I don't know why to this day why he never did. Um, I think I just kind of like gave him his space and respected him. And maybe he was like, cool, that's fine. We're, we're good. And then finally somebody told me that he was a wolf dog. And I'm like, oh, okay, I get it. I get it now. I get why he's so different. You could just tell. You could feel it in every movement. Um, the way he looked at things, you could just tell he was not a husky. Um, and the stories from from his owner, she would walk 20 miles plus a day with this animal. And she had to go different routes every single day to prevent him from getting bored of doing the same route. So she had him trained very well. You know, he she anytime she was walking where people were, she had him on leash. But usually if she was out deep in the forest, she was able to have him off leash. Um, but she had to really, really exercise him because if she didn't, you know, the behavior kicks up. We see it even with our own domestic dogs too. If you're not exercising them enough, behavior kicks up. They're going to chew stuff. A wolf chewing stuff compared to a husky chewing stuff, it's going to do a lot more damage comparatively. You know, a German shepherd's jaw pressure is about 750 pounds per square inch. A full grown adult wolf is 1,500. Um, so it's a lot more damage that can be done a lot faster. Um, so it's, it's been unfortunate to see how media has first demonized them. And now that they're kind of becoming popular, they've almost kind of become a status symbol in a way, um, that if people can, you know, have a wolf and be in control of one, that it's some kind of status thing that it makes them cool or special or or whatever um so it's still it's better but it's still not good it's still not good um there's a long way to go for wolves in media i think still
That is a great answer. Um, we're going to be wrapping up soon. So does anybody else have any questions? Just raise your hand or open your mic. If anybody does have questions after the session too, Tammy, feel free to pass along my email to the club. Um, if you think of something in the middle of the night, <laughs> shoot me an email. I am happy to to kind of follow up with you because I know sometimes during chats like this, you're just like absorbed in, in listening. Um, so if you do think of something after the fact that you want to ask me, please feel free to reach out by email. I, I'm usually pretty quick at getting back to folks, so don't be shy. I appreciate that very much. I'm going to put the uh, email in the chat right now for everybody. Um, I think Riley's going to take over uh, to end it up here to wrap it up. Yeah, well, no, I if anyone has anything like once, twice sold, um, I wanted to thank Marina again. Thank you so much. It was very informative. I learned a lot um, and hopefully one day I'll get the opportunity to go up and visit uh, something that now I want to cross off my bucket list. Um, I did also want to acknowledge um, that although we're not on campus right now, um, the University of Windsor um, is located on the territory of the Three Fires Confederacy of First Nations comprised of the Ojibwe, the Ottawa, and the Potawatomi peoples, um, and that we're grateful to work, learn, and live in this area. And unfortunately, I don't know the land treaty that the Halliburton Forest falls on, but um, I do want to acknowledge that. So. We are on um, on First Nations land. Well, I think that about does it. I think we're good for time right now. Um, so thank you again, Marina. I really do appreciate it. Tammy, thank you for taking the reins and organizing this. I really appreciate it. And um, hopefully we can do another event like this in the future. Thank you so much, awesome. Marina. Thanks. This is great. <laughs> yeah, thanks for having me. Um, it's been fun. I always enjoy chatting with folks and sharing what I know, and hopefully it continues to inspire all of you in the world of animals and people. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a great night, okay? Take care. All right. Thank you. Bye. Bye.